the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people were evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos, and articles, and images. We spent a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live, it's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story, they were helping their neighbor. If a family was being evacuated, a group would just jump in and help out. So it was huge. They were watching out for each other. So hello everybody, thank you for coming, thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Hello everyone, I'm geologist Philip Ong, here with Mr. Dane DuPont, HawaiiTracker.com, bringing you guys another Kilauea and a little bit Mauna Loa volcano update today, Thursday, September 9th, 2021. Been a pretty quiet week on both volcanoes, Kilauea is just coming out of the intrusionary pulse, and so it's been quiet just a little bit, and there are still changes happening on the ground, we'll go over those. Mauna Loa has been quieter a lot longer, so we'll, we'll spend less time on that. But we will uh, make sure to have time for discussion of live viewer questions. So make sure you pass those on today in, in our uh, chats, uh, wherever you're finding our streams. Let us know if there's any issue with our audio, video quality, anything like that. Uh, we're going to be manning that as well. And uh, we will let you guys know what's happening here and starting off with this view of the new webcam the new ko cam but from a usgs hawaiian booking observatory here looking south of kilauea uh, caldera area at the area where the recent intrusion um, was centered so if there had been lava coming to the surface it might have been an area around here but uh, there hasn't been this is just a nice new different view of the area so we can try to put some something more tangible um in our minds when we imagine where these earthquakes are happening and what's happening underground all of that out of out of sight really but underneath this area that's that's shown here looping screen let me stop that so let me give my computer here a little bit and let's turn and show you guys the most recent earthquake patterns here this is the iris earthquake browser 
and I'm going to animate just the last week of earthquakes here. And we only have on this on this uh, week long plot 45 earthquakes here. So you can see they come in. They're mostly concentrated in that area above the intrusionary pulse. Feel a handful down here in the south at the far reaches of that seismic region, but really uh, not a whole lot and not very fast here. That's that's really the whole story for the week. Pretty quiet in the earthquakes. Uh, they're still happening, still happening in that area in particular, right? With that ongoing um, adjustments, but not nearly the rate that they were happening before. And we'll show you show you how that compares here. This is the last week of earthquakes from the automatic USGS map. So you can see there's that, that clustering right at the south part of the summit. And really, it's very striking how few earthquakes there are in that upper east rift uh, area, east rift connector, depending on what you like to call it, and even into the, the east rift zone itself, right? This middle east rift zone through here, also very, very quiet. Really don't see anything, hardly any, any, any of the way down the rift zone at all, although you do still see earthquakes a good amount of the way down here, suggesting that the south flank is probably still moving, as it you know does all the time. Probably still going, uh, regardless of anything else happening with the magma coming in and out. It's just got its, it's marching to its own beat, so to speak, at this point in time. So um, that's the last week. If we compare it to the last month, this is the last month going back from today, you really get a much better sense of how we've really focused activity here in this lineation that goes along the south part of the summit into that seismic southwest rift zone. Very obvious there. Went in for you guys a bit here. Better view. Seismic Southwest Rift lineation, and you know within a lot of that that very that second week of August, there was a little bit of earthquake still in that Upper East Rift connect, uh, East Rift connector, but not as many as the, as that pr previous week. So you do see a little bit here, but not nearly as strongly as before. Right, and then that's uh, let me put it if I can compare it now to what it was a, w a month and a week ago, including that first week of August when most of these earthquakes over here actually. So you really see the pattern about a, from about a month and a, and a week ago where the volcano was pressurized everywhere, the whole summit region, that whole upper east rift, and the seismic southwest rift as well was all, all has been active for a long time. We've been pointing out for a while. And then within the last month, focusing more so to the southwest area here, and less so up here in the summit and less so over here. Um, Notice in the last month, the south flank is still showing a good amount of, of seismicity all through here still. And coming back to the last week here for comparison, the last week is really, really, really quiet. And that's really our theme today. Here's how quiet it's been following that seismic flurry. And quiet doesn't mean that nothing is happening. Adjustments are still occurring. We'll get into that here a little bit. Uh, it just means it's, it's not happening through earthquakes or things that are very noticeable on the surface. So some of the sensors are giving us some clues, though. It's going to take some sleuthing to figure them out. First, we'll go over the top-level stuff here. Show you guys this earthquake rates for the past year. Hello, Leia. Let me better over here. So this is the past year. So this is our intrusion spike over here, peaking at 1,200 events in a single week. And you can see we're back down to this this uh, elevated background, right? This background is what we've had since the the end of the summit eruption on Kilauea, when the lava lake crusted over and lava stopped coming out. We've been back to this level, which is similar to the level we saw before that eruption, late 2020. It also had an intrusionary pulse and an uh, eruption buildup sequence right through there as well. During the eruption, much lower. In between, and since then, it's been quite a bit higher, leading to this intrusion. So we're back down, but we're still at this level. That's the point I'm getting at here, right? So. That's the whole last month and a week build up over here. So we're you guys and the peak of it. Now that's quieting down and ramping down. You can't really see it very well here. I could zoom it in, but really it's only been a week. So this one week is going to end up being lower and may end up being somewhere back akin to this level compared to what we were before. So since it's so hard to see in this year long plot, we're only get one week per point. We'll switch over to the monthly plot here. So here's a past month earthquakes per day now on this axis. That, that's a vertical here, 450 to zero at the bottom. So we peaked up um, at around 60, 370, somewhere in there, um, above between 350 and 400 during that heaviest day of seismicity. But really, you got to add in the day before and after kind of lumped together and are divided artificially here in between. So anyways, that was our first peak of intrusion. 
a little bit of quiet or second pulse with that, uh, um, starting with that flurry of earthquakes and then that longer term um, movement of earthquakes down further in the southwest rip is what we saw here. And really since then, this past week, this is what we're looking at here is this quiet, right? They're down to in the range of 50 or less earthquakes per day down here for the last week. So it's really quieted down quite a bit. And that's the pattern of earthquakes for the last month here. If we take a examination here of the time, looking at a month once again, but now at depth, right across that whole bucket of areas from the surface down to we're only going down to five kilometers below the surface here. So this is only the upper uppermost slices of the volcano here. Uh, you can see here that this was our our first little flurries back in August that were starting to give us some indications that we're ramping up towards a, a quicker change here. Our first pulse of intrusion came through right here, small gap. Our second one came through right here, and actually one high intensity peak and then a, a lower, um, deeper set of adjustments going on with less shallow stuff here. And then you can see there was a, a, another small little flurry here that came in on a fourth. And that's really the only thing otherwise mostly quiet. You can see that flurry in a fourth was actually in a shallower region above this one kilometer line, right? You might remember or need to be reminded there's a kind of a kind of a gap here, right? This is that upper upper flatter area and this is that deeper um more vertical dike like area, right? This upper one being more like the sill here that's that's got a aspect ratio that is broader in both directions than that is tall. So interesting to see how the, how those might be interplaying. Clearly, the adjustment happening perhaps in both regions, right? Although this this is not necessarily exactly that same structure. It's just at that same depth based on this plot right here. Interesting to see fewer adjustments happening deeper down as far as seismicity, and a little bit shallower is what we're seeing here, and less so overall than before, but still happening there. So moving on, I'll show you guys a tilt at Sand Hill. This is the closest instrument to that intrusion. So our axis here is in microradians, and it's going from positive 60 to negative 60. 120 microradians is a huge, huge range. That means these, it's not, we're not seeing any real noise. It's all really all little wiggles here. So all, all the signals you see are real movement of the tilt meter, whether it be through the first pulse of intrusion right here that began on the 23rd and ended on the 25th right there, right? The line is, was, was, fairly steady and then changing, 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 and steady again. So this period of change right in here is that first pulse. And similarly, the second pulse after that period of, of uh, interlude of rest right here, right? You can see the second pulse came in and changed for a longer duration of time right there, right? That's what the, the green line is our, is our dominant signal here, right? So uh, from that sill-like structure, slight, slightly shorter, and delayed pattern of that, right, showing that it's secondary to the, the primary component here being in this, this tangential axis on this sand hill tilt meter, right, that's pointing to the southeast towards that rift, that um, dike area, whereas the radial the blue line points towards Hale Ma'u Ma'u and in between Hale Ma'u Ma'u and the station, that sill area. So the point being here that there hasn't been a whole lot of change in recent Ever since that that uh, equilibration around the 30th, you can see that that's been fairly steady. Some adjustments a little bit down, a little bit up, maybe more so down in the last few days. You know, this might be something in the range of three, four microradians. Not a huge amount compared to what we've seen already, but you know, clearly adjustments are still happening um, in that deck region on the surface, and maybe less so towards Halimau. This may be the Halimau signal we're seeing before that may have resumed its previous pattern right there. Hard to tell exactly where that's coming from, but the previous pattern of that blue line was also that slow rise and similar here to, with the blue line. So that's the normal background and um, doing a little bit different here, still adjusting, um, but towards that shallower area and towards Halimamau, back to the, the background pre intrusion status there. So looking at information and closer to Halimamau itself, here is the tilt last two days. You can see here it's it's to see things in that scale usually. Past week here you can see that we've maybe gained three micro radians in the last week so maybe, maybe we're rising at a, at a slow rate here. Um, but over the last month you can see that, that that rate is a fairly recent thing. Here's that recent rise perhaps. And prior to that no change really over the course of a whole month. See that, that all that change that happened 
between a 23rd and 25th, and between a 26th and a 30th, and barely registered anything on this tilt meter signal here. And if it did, it's much smaller than the previous variations of deflation and inflation events and what we're seeing now. So really very, very weak signal, if at all, over here at my, my north part of the, the Caldera shallower reservoir system. So that's fascinating. It's doing something separate in two different places. And uh, looking at the GPS at the summit, um, you can see that the pattern has changed here in response to that recent intrusion. And it's a little complicated, so we're going to dig into this a little bit more shortly. But um, just uh, we're not going to get an answer from here that shows anything. Doesn't, there's nothing obvious as far as something happening at Halimaumau. The clearest, you know, uh, most enticing thing is this most recent. Fairly slow. Let me look steep on this plot because the range isn't that big. It's from four to two minus two microradians. Right, we're only going up a little bit, but it's it's the most enticing thing um, that we have, and it's really standing on its own there. Okay. As far as the gas data, the gas could tell us if magma is coming towards the surface as well. Uh, did have a measurement come through on September second, coming in at 110, 115 tons per day, right through there. Uh, that's still within that background range. It's still fairly low. We had a new measurement come in just yesterday that's back down around 60. So still within a range, natural variations, uh, you know, there's not, nothing we can learn from the gas there. We have been looking at the ambient monitors as well, and you can see here that for the past month uh, at Cone Peak, you know, natural variations, but no real change of, of the range here, right? We're really looking at less than 1 ppm. Same thing here, less than 1 ppm at the Sand Hill station for gas. Uh, going further down at the Pu'e station here, HRPKE, we do see something a little more suspicious. suspicious. We mentioned this last week. This is up to uh, 60 ppm on its scale, so we have a spike that goes up to nearly 50. We did uh, uh, hear from the USGS that this was uh, station uh, maintenance, in fact. So here is a recent photo release they, they did as well. Showing you guys what the station actually looks like. So here it is. Here's HRPKE station right there. There's a electronics maintenance staff member from HVO. Checking the solar panel, as you can see the, the gut of the, so the station is in here instead of this protective enclosure. Wiring diagrams all through there, you know, circuit boards, all kinds of uh, probably desiccants, things like that in there. Another big, big uh, container back here that's probably got the batteries and those kind of things. And everything uh, is relayed. I don't really quite see the top of the mast here, but there's a mast up here that has a, a typically a radio transmitter that will tra transmit back to the tower summit of the volcano. That's how that data gets back and that gets processed onto the website there. Still station maintenance here. Oh, look, and there's actually uh, more than just just the gas. This is a gas, and there likely is perhaps GPS. Looks like over there, and there's a radio transmitter actually. So interesting little installation there. We have some more. I mean, that looked perhaps a different kind of tra transmission there. Right, I'm not sure exactly. A lot of different. Uh, Designs that are used. Better look at the box here. Technician Stephen Fouquet. And for photograph from Patrick Nado. The view from the southwest from H from uh, HRPKE, showing Pu'uko'ae on Kilauea Southwest Rift in the background. That's right here. This this. Um, you can see lava flows from the seventy four eruption in the foreground. Uh, that flowed southwest. So, up for you guys, you can get a, a better view here as well. It's view, a typical view of the southwest rift. A lot of that uh, sand and ash from the explosive phases of Kilauea eruptions that blow downwind and then get, 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 get remobilized by wind and rain and that kind of thing as well. So, distributed across other places, right? So, you can see it here in the older flows and then. This younger stuff that doesn't have that ash and tephra on it, that's the younger 74. Slight tangent there to, to 
take a look at these USGS photographs uh, that they put out. And because the question is often related and we have uh, info from the USGS today, it'll pack it on right here as well, that they did go and they sampled the Keller Well in the South Caldera as well, at the end of August here, August 31st. So here they are actually pulling out the, the, the water container and, and transferring the water into the sample bottle back to the lab and get analyzed. So they measure the chemistry of the water. They also measure, measure, measure the depth, uh, those kind of things as well. So you can see here, um, they do note um, they are doing this quarterly, four times a year here. Um, broader view of the Keller well, you can see uh, someone taking some notes measure of, the, of the measurements here. Um, someone's doing the winching. And I do note that there are not significant changes as a result of this event. No changes in the depth of the water below the ground, which is still approximately 514 meters, 1,686 quarters feet below the ground surface under this. Right? So a lot of winching right, to put out that almost 1,700 cable. Okay, and so. Uh, Last thing, um, as far as the part of their release from September 7th here, photo and video update photos, is a view of the summit of this area we're considering now, this summit area of the cooled, crusted lava lake that's still liquid on the inside but crusted over, um, not venting really that much gas, not really showing any changes on the surface. Not, you know, um, the Uikahuna station is over here on this side, like up, up on this rim farther up here, um, not showing nearly as much change as the Crater Rim station. It's farther over on the other rim of the caldera back over there. So to analyze some of these GPS signals, we're going to go to the Kilauea monitoring map now. And so here's just the last week of earthquakes. You can see that cluster right through there. And you can see I've, I've put on here the GPS stations, the stars, the little red lines are the, the tilt stations. So if you're curious where that Sand Hill station is, that's this red bar right over here. And where that H, H, uh, uh, Ukwa'e station, gas station is, that's over here, right? Sand Hill station. Gas is here. Moon Peak Station is over here. So, Wikahuna, that's a tilt meter. I'm going to click, let's see if I can click on the GPS. Let's get it here. And you can check it out for the last two year plot here and zoom it out so I can walk through it a little bit if you guys haven't seen this before. Three components is an east, a north, and an up. So, it's broken into those three azimuths, azimuth directions, right? And, uh, the, the, the one that's measuring cross caldera distance is a north-south in particular. So there are changes in all of them, and you can see here that the, the east underwent a change. Underwent a change, but it seems like, a, like it's going back to its previous pattern, perhaps. Uh, the north is a little less clear. Its pattern might have been something like this. So it may have resumed its previous pattern. It clearly had a little jump, and so that, that slight jump may have affected um, the, the distance measurement there, but just note it is moving north at Uwekahuna. And not a whole lot of change and up at Uwekahuna. Pretty steady, really not affected up and down. But if we go here across to the station in the south that we're measuring against, Crater Rim, back down here. Let's look at this two-year displacement. We're going to zoom way into the right once again here. And once again, east is at the top. So you can see where we moved east Pretty rapidly here, you can see how the, the circles are spaced out here for that first week. And you can see that it's much closer together, much more bunched together here, but it actually is still moving a little bit to the east. Slower, but still moving to the east. As far as uh, uh, north and south, you can see that previously Crater Rim was moving to the south. Wukahuna was moving north, Crater Rim was moving south. That's what was spreading them apart and growing that cross caldera distance. And Crater Rim got pushed to the north by that intrusion. And since then, it does not appear to have resumed its previous trend, but rather it's lollygagging or perhaps even still moving north a little bit, uh, but at a much slower rate, given the cluster of ink right over there. And so still adjusting clearly. It's not doing what it was before. It's still, still um, has to turn around to come back down this way for it to really be termed um, Back to back to this previous trend here in this very very localized station at Crater Rim, yeah. And as far as the up at Crater Rim, you can see here, uh, looks like it's still going up as well. 
Right? So it could be that without any earthquakes, magma is still coming into that area. It's still filling that dike in that region, and it's still, or you know, it's it's not coming in as fast anymore. But but it's moving within that area and re reconfiguring itself based on the forces and gravity and confining pressure and all that, so that the blocks around it are also adjusting and rising and swelling and all of that, one or the other. Um, certainly the tilt isn't showing us any huge injection of magma like we saw before. If it is, it's like a much slower trickle, if anything. And that's why the USGS is writing that, that the, the, the injection of magma has either slowed or ceased, right? Not necessarily ceased, not necessarily slowed. See the ambiguity here until we wait for more data to get in. Hard to really tell here just from the from plot. This is uh, create a rim. That, this is one that's important for our cross cut our measurement. Let me see if I can pull that back up here. Right over here. And so you can imagine that if they're both moving north, then it's not really giving you, it's not really measuring the point in between at Hale Mau Mau anymore. It's measuring the, the differential from the point to the south. That's what we're really seeing um, over here. Right? Because Critter Rim is still moving to the north, and so therefore everything is, is being affected still by that, that movement. That's what we can see here. All right, let's go back to the map. There it is. And uh, what I want to point out is the outlet station over here. So it's outlet station you can see is right above this zone of seismicity. So once again, click on the two-year plot. You can see the outlet. Its east component. This is what it looks like when it was go. You know, it was not changing a whole lot. Maybe going west a little bit. Jumped to the east during that week-long intrusion. Really spread out. And then now, for the last week, it's all clustered together. And it's probably you know, I can't tell any any trend. You know, but it's similar to this range you're seeing in here, right? So this is probably uh, was it was pushed from the west and moved to the east, and now it's no longer getting pushed. From the west anymore. That's telling us at the outlet. As far as uh, the north component here, I'm trying to maneuver it too. As far as up uh, the, the north component here, uh, we were moving south. We got pushed to the north quickly, and now we're probably moving south about like before, right? So we're no longer getting pushed either. To the north or to the east, right? However, the up is still moving, still moving up. So interesting to note that, right? Because we had we had this uh, uh, discussed previously when we let's see if I can get this this plot up here, yeah, this uh, map of the, the deformation area um, based on the NSR modeling from the USGS, right? Of which it's this this big oval area right in here, and the earthquakes are at the right side of it. So we kind of saw a pattern of seismicity first here, then moving further down over this way, right, corresponding to perhaps the inflation of this whole area. Right? So if our station being right here got pushed to the east and to the north, that makes sense if it's inflating over here. If suddenly it's no longer getting pushed east and north, but rather it's going straight up, then it's getting pushed from directly underneath just this area. And so the center of our deformation has switched in the last week here from being more over here to being more over here now, right? It's a lot less, it's a lot, uh, um, it's been dialed down quite a bit, but we also have a, a shift in, in the geography of it as well. That's what I was trying to show, show you guys through this, these, these, these plots in this map here, right? Still moving up, no longer moving east. It's, it's, I'll give you, it's moving up a lot slower, right? You can see these points are clustered more together. But it's still moving up. Clearly, the first week where it's really spread out and the second week where it's really spread out are both moving up. Which is an interesting nuance there. So I'm having to use this map to show you guys. It's really that's only true at a station here and then a station here. Um we can go to Ahua here and let's see what see what Ahua shows us. Ahua uh, was getting pushed east, moved a lot faster, and maybe is still getting pushed faster than before. As far as moving south, it's probably back to what it was. As far as moving up, it may still be moving up as well. So maybe at Ahua, there is still some, some change happening. That one, that one, and that one. Here's our three stations getting affected. I go farther over to this one, Uhimao. 
a look at the last two years, you can see while well, we were going east a little faster, still going east, not a whole lot of change. We were going south, north a little bit, back south. We're going up within a range. Really can't see a whole lot of changes convincing a couple of data points above there, but really not, not a whole lot of effect visible right there. So it doesn't go that far. It doesn't go that far. Right, Coon Peak over here. Get to the GPS. Here we go. Coon Peak. Oh, no, we can't get Coon Peak because uh, it's not online with it. So I have to go through. These two I cannot get for that. So I won't, go, I won't get there today. Um, but maybe we can check Mane Station here. The last two years. East. that up and maybe we're clustered. It's hard to tell if we're still moving up or what's going on there. No change visible at all throughout any of the sequence in the north-south or the up and down. So that's just that's just the, the, the whole story here, the little nuance of what we can add to what the USGS has said as far as activity uh, being still slowly changing but not being any earthquake. So one, well, a couple couple final things here on Kilauea. You know, one is just to want to show you guys a whole earthquake map for the whole island. Um, here it is. You can see that this is the whole last week. If I were to put it on the last day, you'd see nothing on Kilauea. So it's really, you know, really has. To, they're all yellow, right? Not even any or any oranges there. Um, there are some down here in Pahala. Pahala region is still still uh, active, and we won't focus on it once again today. But it's still doing its thing. I wanted to recount here the earthquakes that we have on the island and around the island in the last week of largest magnitude. There is one unusual one at 3.6 that was at 6.7 6 kilometers deep offshore, um, farther off from Loihi. Loihi is right over here, so it's far enough away it's not really Loihi. And it's likely one of these uh, flexural adjustments of the crust as the whole everything is shifting around. Think of it as, you know, um, get a bunch of, bunch of people all on the same mattress and someone's wiggling around. Everyone gets to feel it even at the other end of the mattress. That's the rest of the earth with the volcanoes and the islands on it and the adjustments that happen over here on the big island can induce flexural changes further away from that. That's all normal. At 3.6 it was felt reported there was a 3.5 in Pahala uh, yesterday, 3.4 the day before, which was a day at this one as well, 3.6. Um, There is, I uh, wanted to just make sure we, we touch base on this again. You can still see in the seismographs, you still see that occasional band of tremor, right? That's not anything alarming. It's not um, anything that's clipping, right? You, know, you can see by clipping, I mean it's, it's, it's maxing out the signals. When you have an earthquake like this one, you can see it's got a limit of how fat it can get. That's the clip right there. So when you start to see vibration of the tremor and it's looking that thick all the way across, then you, then you can really tell. Um, that there's something going on. So somewhat the, the heaviness of the line, right, more like this, is what you'd be looking for to look at for that tremor. So there's still some tremor going on. It's not a huge amount, not pervasive, not constant, anything like that. And there's nothing alarming about it. And I just wanted to point that out since we have been seeing it and wondering about it as, as time goes on here, uh, past that, that eruption here. So everything comes from this. All of our information is adding and building upon this USGS HVO update issued this past Tuesday here, not erupting. Um, earthquake rates and ground formation have remained near pre-intrusion levels. No significant changes in other streams. They've noted that the past week had 75 small earthquakes, all below 2.5, compared to 732 the previous week. Same depth range and all that. So two is low. They mentioned Halemaumau, stagnant, no indications of the Halemaumau event resuming eruption. Thrift zone, no unusual activity noted. That's the the. Mauna Loa, I'm sorry, the Kilauea update. And we will just quickly move on to the Mauna Loa update as well, issued today, and because there's not a whole lot of change there. 60 small magnitude earthquakes, all beneath uh, uh, some upper elevation flanks. Shallow depths. Do you guys hear the GPS? Hasn't changed since April, really. The tilt is not something that's very reliable unless it's coming towards the surface, so it's not really worth looking at it any further. But you know, there's there's that earthquake rates. Make sure this is refreshed for you guys here. You can see that since April as well. 
low rates, you know, maybe a little bit up, a little bit down, but still all within this very, very low background level here. And just mentioning it, a little lack of activity here. In the last week, same areas, northwest, over southwest rift zone, and over here to the southeast. So you get a little bit better view of what's going on if you look here at this whole past month of data. So over here in the northwest, southeast, very southwest and southeast areas. And one last thing to focus on here, we'll look at the cross section, right, with just this longitude versus depth here. So you can see the magma chamber, it's thought to be somewhere in the region in here. So over here to the side of it, in the northwest, we have those shallow earthquakes. And the southwest ones are falling likely in here. And I wanted to point out the ones over here to the southeast, right? You can see this is this is uh, 10 kilometers down, right? This is this is basically the south flank of Mauna Loa right here. You can really see how it's it's the whole thing all the way through steadily seems to be just almost vibrating along long term, right? These small water. Really it's Mauna Loa, it's similar to Kilauea, and it's really about the south flank moving, and it seems like it's moving enough, and we'll open more of those cans of worms and the research and all that in the future. Bit of that here for today. One last thing I did want to check before we uh, switch to our thank yous and questions is this uh, USGS homepage here. Um, just to see if this come out. All right, Dan. Nope, nothing new. I've been checking. Um, yeah, let's do some thank yous and we'll get into some questions. If anybody does have questions, go ahead and get them in the chat. I'll look back through right before we get into that uh, Q&A session. But I want to thank our supporters that help bring these streams to you. First is the viewers. If you're here watching this now, we thank you. Maybe consider like, subscribing, sharing. All that stuff helps the channel grow. It really does. Uh, we do take monetary donations on hawaiitracker.com slash support. If you like to uh, make that kind of uh, donation, that's where to do it. Uh, we do have some uh, organizations that are supporting us. Uh, first one is Kaleo's Bar and Grill in the heart of Pahoa. And, you know, it's a very home, uh, gives that old feeling of a restaurant. They got indoor, outdoor seating. Uh, they do takeout as well. Some traditional dishes with a little bit of local flair on them. Uh, reasonably priced, always a good place to stop by for locals and uh, anybody visiting. If you're in and around Poa, check them out. It's Kaleo's there, right in, uh, right below the church, the painted church and or the uh, church on the hill, uh, Sacred Hearts in Poa. So check them out. Our second sponsor is uh, Kalani Tours and they will operate out of Kona. They primarily do Ocean to our volcano tours, waterfall tours, and the Kona Coffee Farm tours as well. And they have a very small team, then they take small tours. So it's more, you get that more personalized feel as, as opposed to just being packed onto the big shuttle buses and getting yelled at, a, yelled at over a loudspeaker on. So, the, you know, we really appreciate them for their continued support. We do have a Five dollar CA super chat from. Oh my God! It's Leet speak. Uh, Pepe, Mert, uh, uh, Matt. <laughs> we'll go with that. Um, oh, we Matt. appreciate that as well. <laughs> yeah, that Leet speak. It gets me. Um, all right. So we do have uh, at least one question here, and from Dave on. Facebook, he asks, uh, do you think the magma is kind of at the end of activity on the big island, so to speak, as lava shifts towards Loihi? You know, we've talked about the drift and uh, how the islands move more to the north. What's the, the timelines of that um, in general speak? Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a while. I mean, you you certainly can have variations. I, mean, we're, we're, I think we're you know we're learning about the variations in the short term and the human timeline, time time you know in the human lifetime. Um, looking at Kilauea and Mauna Loa taking turns and possibly trying to feed off of the same source and not being able to both both do it at the same time for the most part. It seems like they both can if, can if there's a surge from below. So it, it's interesting like that, right? So there are feedback. I'm, I'm bringing this up just to say that there are feedbacks. Uh, that 
uh, seem seem to indicate that you that you know um, having magma go in one direction, it's it's actually prevented from going somewhere else. So in that case, you'd, you'd say that Loihi is probably getting deprived compared to Kilauea right now, um, just as Mauna Loa is getting deprived. Right? In the longer geologic term, though, it's the, you know the, we. The, the alternation can happen frequently enough that it's essentially almost constantly going to all of them. And um, certainly you would imagine that the farthest one away, which would probably be Mauna Loa, would likely shut off before Kilauea as Loihi starts up. So you could go from, you know, for example, a Mauna Loa and Kilauea dominant pattern to a Kilauea and Loihi dominant pattern, perhaps. I would consider that to be more likely than to just see just everything in the Big Island shut off and then go to just Loihi. Now, within a short periods of time, within a few years here and there, you know, at some point in time, within geologic time, that certainly can happen. Um, but because those other medium-term cycles are, are something we haven't seen yet, we haven't seen that happen in, in recorded history here in, in Hawaii, I'm not going to expect that to happen in my lifetime. Once again, either. yeah, I don't, don't expect to see everything shut off except what, we, um, what actually happens. Right. It's interesting to think about. Yeah, so thank, thanks for that, that question, Dave. Yeah. Chris asks, uh, the Iki tilt meter has registered almost eight microradians of tilt in the last month. Is there anything to that? Yeah, so I mean, it's, that's, that's interesting, right? Um, let me see if I can get... So here's our map once again. Here's the tilt meter. See that's yeah, it's been online for almost a whole month continually now, and it is still coming, climbing upwards, right? So it's it's it likely is is swelling, and let me point out here where this tilt meter is. You can see it here on the map. Let me see if I can get more earthquakes. Let me here. I'll switch back to this plot earthquakes for the last month. So Kilaiki sits uh, right here, right in there. And there's a little bit of a, of a gap right here, but this is kind of that same southern edge of the caldera lineation pattern, right? That boundary of it right there. So what I imagine happening, and we saw a cluster of earthquakes at Kilaiki early on in that sequence as well, is that that's part of that whole process, right? This whole south caldera, edge of the caldera is what's getting pushed or you know um, influenced to go in this direction right um various reasons and the magma is coming in from that area and it's trying to fill in essentially that plane right there you know um a little simplified because it's 3d that that region let's call it so you can see that a clear extension of this area would be Kiloiki. i'd imagine that this whole south caldera margin is likely having um magma movement and likely magma has been filling this area both here and here. That was what I would suspect, right? And, every, and everywhere in between as well. So that's my, uh, you know, speculative guesswork answer there, right? Um, without without having any further data beyond that, right? I would love to have hidden star of everywhere and be able to model things separately and all that, but uh, that's all uh, SGS as we all have. So I can add to that answer a little bit, I think. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you could go back to the map where we can bring up tilt meters. It's important to look at what a tilt meter can do when there's no volcanic activity associated with it. Nothing new in any ways. So one one that we brought up before is Huala Lai, right? To show just the drift that the tilt meter can get can catch. Yeah, there is drift, yeah. But that one wasn't drifting beforehand. Mm. Thing. Before, I mean, it was it was hard to tell because it was going on and offline, right? That that upward uh, um, pattern began, um, yeah, may, maybe in late July or so when that earthquake sequence happened in Hercule. Something, something mm. I can, I've noticed and kept my eye on, eye on as well. So yeah, I mean, I definitely see you there, Chris. Um, that's that's the best I can I, I can offer. Yeah, and, yep, but Dane's totally right. Right, let's go, go over here to Hawaii to the tow meter. So you guys. A similar kind of you yeah. know um, look and plot here, right? That's in this case it's just a drift, and there's nothing volcanic happening. A little smaller scale, but yeah. 
it's possible as right. well that you know the earthquakes could have disrupted the tilt meter installation or something like that, right? And you know, um, Maybe change the background right drift now. or something like that. Something like something that funny could all, always happen as well. And so that's why we really need the expert when it's coming. To, yeah, right. When it's going in and out of operation, or um, you know, the giant holes in it, it kind of makes you wonder a little bit if it, yeah, something yeah. happened to it. Yeah. So yeah. The, All right. The month previous to this, it was yeah. There were quite a lot of data holes. This would... So follow up question. It looks like Casey asks, "How much is a micro radiant?" I'll just we USGS provided this one a while back, but it's always good just to go back through it. You take a one kilometer long board, perfectly flat, and you insert a dime under one end of it. The angle change that you see is the equivalent to one micro radiant. That's how small of the measurement we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, is that yeah. the right one? I was yeah. confused yeah, if it's right. a yeah, nickel yeah. or a dime. <laughs> well, it's, about, it's it's. I think for the purposes of someone visualizing it, it's about the same. Yeah, I mean, um, right. It's you know, I I, I if you remember geometry class, you ever had to take geometry and math. Remember, you know, the you know, the three hundred sixty degrees is the same as two pi, and two pi is in a radians, right? And a micro radian is a million of a radian, right? That's the same the same word, radian. Degrees and radian. It's a it's a measure. It's an angle measure. It's just a very very small micro angle. Right. Uh, we have a $20 super chat from Langer. Uh, no comment. I appreciate it. Hello, Mahalo. Definitely helps. Uh, I think we have one more question here. Um, this one's not exactly volcano related, but it still kind of relates enough. Any news on the Poiki boat ramp work being started? Um, let you answer that. Right. So we have the Poiki boat ramp, which is waiting for an EA, an environmental assessment, which was talked about for the past two years, but never really had the trigger pulled on it. So now we're waiting on that to be completed, which FEMA has said that they would require in order to give the funding for the dredge. So it's on hold for the next several months. The other one that we just found out about yesterday or the day before was... Um, that the Poiki Road, that they were going to rebuild the road going down to Poiki, but then they decided to do a realignment of that roadway in the lower section. That realignment is involved, it, it's all of a package, like it's a giant package that uh, thing that was submitted to FEMA, and they're going to require an EA on the realignment part. At least that's what it reads to me is that part, it, it needs an EA. So now we're going to be waiting at least six months, realistically, from the archaeologists I've spoken with. It's going to be more like a year of delay. So that's the news on Poiki is a bunch of delays waiting for environmental assessments that the authorities didn't think that they would need, but ended up needing anyways. And I believe cotton, that... Cotton bureaucracy a little bit, I guess, right? Trying, but... Yeah. Getting tripped Seems up. like... Seems like the handoff between the state, the county, and the feds is just as sloppy as can be. Like they don't know which way the runners go in. There's fumbles all over the place. It's just, it's not clean. It's not clean. Um, and you know, people get hurt the longer they wait. You know, there's people that were expecting to be able to you know restart their farms um, with that road, and now it's like, oh, just wait another year. You know, it, it's rough. Yeah, that's still still a fallout of the, of the 2018 eruption, which uh, will be featured in Danes's upcoming drones on video he's premiering tonight. Anything else you want to tell us about that, Dane? Uh, no, it's actually it's a pretty good one. Uh, there's a bunch of different interesting things to talk about from the rate in which the flow is going through the lava channel, which ranges with people, even the authorities and media saying 40 miles an hour. And we doubt that, you know, we doubt that and show that it's not going that fast. Uh, we also talk about how the Department of, Department of Land and Natural Resources shows up into the eruption. And one of the things that they do is they make it illegal to touch cool lava, even if it's on your property, even if it is your property. So we talk about some of that. And 
we also talk about some of the lava rafts that are coming down the lava channel and making their way out into the ocean. So yeah, check it out. We're going to premiere that immediately after this live stream. So give us a few minutes and then that'll be up. It runs about 10 minutes long. And we're, yeah, June, it's June 16th, but we go back to finish off June 15th and it runs through the 21st of 2018. So yeah, that'll be on immediately after this. Mahalodain, yeah, we'll look forward to that. And yeah, thanks everyone who contributed, who donated, who supported, liked, shared. If you haven't liked and shared, you get a chance here. We're gonna wrap it up here quickly. And while you're waiting for a video to start, you can go share, tell someone about it, or go find some, find some YouTube crazy and let them know where some real information is. So we will might start asking you to do more and more often here. And otherwise, we'll we'll be back with you guys next week, unless something else happens in between. It's looking quiet now. Things can. can Obviously, ramp up fairly quick. If it does, we'll let you guys know. Um, otherwise, we'll keep putting updates on HawaiiTracker.com. If you want to see uh, different different versions of that information, you can check there and frequently as well. So we do that, have a twenty five dollar super chat that just came through from Gary Bryan. Um, but thank you for your continued support. He says thanks, Bill and Dane. That's the that's the message. Mahalo, Gary. Once again, thank you All guys. Right. Yeah. Gary's going to get the last word here because otherwise, Dane DuPont and Philip Ong. Aloha, everyone.